everyone. Welcome to another episode of The Urban Gardener. So glad that all of you could join with me today on this episode. Please, if you can, hit that subscribe button down below and follow along with more adventures as we get growing here on The Urban Gardener. Today, we have a really special episode. We're back in Portland, Oregon, and we're back up on the rooftop of Noble Rot, a restaurant wine bar here in Portland that has a really, really cool rooftop garden. So we're gonna go take a tour around, take a look at what's growing on here this season. Uh, last year we were here towards the end of summer, so we're here towards the end of spring. We'll see a little bit of different things that are growing on there. And as you can tell, the background is a lot clearer. So if you check the iCard above for the first video that we did up here at Noble Rot, you'll see that it was during a time when there was just a lot of smoke. So we're getting some really, really good visuals up here. Let's go take a look at this garden. All right, everybody, so we're up here on the Noble Rot Restaurant and Wine Bar's rooftop garden, and back with us again, Mark Boucher Colbert, really great gardener here at Hi Top everybody. Here. We're gonna be going through, and he's gonna kind of show us about and around here what they got growing on here, and some of the things that they utilize here at the restaurant. First thing we're gonna look at is the, the, sort of the end of spring crop. This is fava beans. We've had a lot of fava beans that overwintered, meaning we planted them in September and they came through the whole winter. And they're a great crop in February and March. Most of the kinds that'll overwinter though will just go put on you in, in, as soon as the hot weather comes. So this is a different kind called Veroma that's got a little more heat tolerance. This one I plant in the early spring. And the cooks love the black and white flowers. And they also use the leaves extensively. And so this is kind of like the last hurrah of the favas. Of course, favas will produce beans. There's the bean pods. And uh, it's kind of a funny, these aren't mature, so you're not gonna see the full. But inside that, it's a very furry bean pod that produces the beans. And then you have to shell that outer husk of the bean to get the edible part inside. So it's a kind of a double shelling. There are a lot of work. Maybe that's why the chefs like to use the leaves and the flowers. A little less work. You don't have to go through all the steps. Anyway, the problems are just about to leave us and uh, we'll move on to other things. Always have a big selection of lettuce. Uh, we're trying uh, a series from a, a, a seed company called Johnny's Selected Seeds in Albion, Maine. They're a great seed company. They grow a lot of stuff from their catalog. And they've pioneered a new kind of lettuce called Salanova to these really compact lettuce rosettes that are packed with leaves, dense packed with leaves, and they form these almost lettuce flowers is really the only way I can describe them. So if you look at, uh, this is one of their, this is their red oak. This is, uh, this is a green oak just packed with leaves there. And as you cut into them, they, uh, they just fall apart and produce really nice. Let's see if we can get it, one of the leaves out of there. Kind of multiple, from, from one stalk to multiple leaves. That's why it gives the effect of being so packed. How do they do it? I don't know. That's one of their proprietary secrets. But we're happy to be able to grow it. And they're, they're great tasting. And they do actually really uh, resist a lot of the extremes of weather and temperature. So it's really a great all-around lettuce. Salanova, they have about eight different kinds. So I encourage you to check those out. Here's another one of our favorites. Uh, this is called Flashy Troutback. It's a romaine lettuce, and it just has these wonderful dapplings of, uh, it's a green leaf with these just wonderful splotches of, of burgundy red all throughout it. So that's really a, uh, a lettuce that I try to keep going all the time up here, Noble Rot. We have a lot of herbs, some scattered throughout, some in certain sections. The garlic chives is a big, favorite and um, I love the their strappy leaves they have uh, flat leaves uh, contrasted to chives that have uh, a standard chive has a rounded tubular leaf and these guys will get yellow and start to fade so what I do every once in a while is just give them a clean cut and then fertilize them heavy with some liquid nitrogen fertilizer like a fish emulsion or something water that in and it brings them back real green and real fresh. 
and so I try to keep, I, I move around all the garlic chives of the garden and I try to keep cutting a couple all the time and fertilizing them. So there's always a couple that are nice and green and fresh. Sure enough, they have a great garlicky taste. Here's another Salanova. This one is, a, a, I think it's the Butterhead one. I don't have my tag, but just look at how densely packed that, that head is. Just amazing. Pretty as all get out. Got some uh, bright light Swiss chard here. Uh, bright lights referring to the variety of stem colors that you get. Uh, yellows, pinks, oranges, reds, nice mix. And then this is a, called Shades of Green Nasturtium. It's a smaller nasturtium leaf and it's, it's, it's much more just for the leaves. And the chefs like them at about quarter size. They'll put them in salads, they'll garnish things with them. Uh, Keep the nasturtium in mind, we're gonna go see after uh, an Incan relative, a relative from South America that we also grew up here called Mashua. Okay. Got some Thai basil, we grow a lot of different kinds of basil. Thai basil, of course, has the anise uh, characteristic anise or uh, licorice taste that's really awesome in all kinds of Asian dishes if you've ever had like Vietnamese pho or anything of that. Uh, style, you're going to want Thai basil to, to give the, you that anise basil -y flavor. Cukes are starting to go up the trellis now. You can see the remnants of last year's beans. So we use these uh, sculptural trellises for beans, cukes, peas, melons, whatever wants to go up. And we grow a lot of pole beans, especially up there. And they don't necessarily need to go straight. The beans will follow the curve. So you can see they came all the way out to here. grow a lot of pea shoots both for garnishes and parts of salads. Um, they take the tips when they're nice and tender. You got to get them when they're really young and tender. So these for example I planted 6-1. Here's how we keep track of stuff. We, uh, I, I, I take this lath this year. I've used a lot of plastic tags but they eventually crack under the UV. So this year I just bought some, uh, some lath from the hardware store. Got a little bit of sandpaper, sanded it smooth. And then I use a Sharpie and write in the crop, the variety. So this variety is called Dwarf Gray Sugar. Really nice and sweet and tender. And plant it on 6-1. So here we are, 18 days later. And they've already been harvested. So these, these were probably ready for harvest three or four days ago. So 15 days, two weeks. That's not a bad turnaround for a crop. Here's some more basil. And because we have a cool, spring nights often i mean we're starting to hit a really warm period here now but um we've had nights uh, almost winter temperatures in in the last few weeks so i like to put this reme over the basil we always try to get the basil in early but then there's always the chance that it won't flourish because of the cool weather so this is kind of a, a little bit of an insurance policy it's called reme agrabon uh, there's a number of different floating row cover the idea that it would float is it just sits lightly on top of the crops and doesn't impede their growth. This one I think has about 85% light transmission, so it gets most of the sunlight and rain and water can pass through it. So uh, it just gives a couple of extra degrees of warmth protection and it, it does make a difference. It gets the basil and really any crop going a little faster, especially during the period of cool nights. I would like to have some of that on hand. A lot of mustard greens. Uh, so we got a kind called Garnet Giant here in the foreground. Now, if the restaurant wanted, one of the nice advantages of having a rooftop garden is they could take these at whatever stage they want. So if they wanted to take a portion of it now, as this would qualify more as microgreens, we're just seeing the first cotyledon leaves, the, uh, the the storage leaves of the seed and then they uh, and in these mustards they're heart shaped and then the first true leaf is emerging here and thereafter every other leaf will look like this it will not look like these heart shaped leaves 
but this would qualify as the microgreen stage. So they could take these as micro or baby. Once you start to see a first true leaf, you're often at the baby stage. And, uh, but they'll let them grow up a little bit more because a lot of times they want a little bit more uh, substance to them so they can cook them down. Micros would be more suitable for top dressing a salad or, or some other dish. Uh, so I think they're gonna let these grow up. A lot of times we'll do this kind of pattern of we got cukes in the back. They're gonna to start to take up more and more of the root zone of this bed. But early on, they're small, so we get a good crop of mustards first. Once we've harvested this, we clear it out. We'll pretty much leave the area clear for that cucumber because it's gonna to start to take all the nutrients in a good, say, four foot square area. And we don't wanna be trying to grow too much else there because then there'll just be a competition between the two. A lot of peppers and pots here, all various kinds. We have a lot of chilies, but then also some sweet peppers. This is a really fun one uh, that I grew last year at my school garden and really loved it. It was really productive. It's called Corbassi. A lot of these come from Eastern Europe. There's a whole Hungary and other uh, Eastern European countries have a big tradition of growing and breeding peppers. A lot of interesting paprikas come from there. This one, Corbassi, uh, I'm not sure exactly which country it comes from, but has these really long, curly, sweet peppers. They look like, like they might be a hot chili or something, but they're sweet. Each plant will produce a profusion of them by the season's end, so we might count on 40 to 50 peppers per plant if we keep them well watered and keep some fertilizer on them as we go through the season. And they'll do fine in this number. This is called the number five pot. Uh, probably holds, I think, four gallons of soil. And... Uh, Fine for a pepper if you if you fertilize it and keep it watered. That's just the right amount. This is a fun little uh, plant that doesn't look like too much right now. This is called Nigella sativa. It's a relative of the common garden flower, Love in a Mist. And after a little while, it's going to put out some interesting bulb-shaped seed heads with little prongs on the top, almost a little crown. And in those seed heads, when they dry the seed pods, there are these... Uh, charcoal black seeds and they have a real strong eucalyptus -y flavor it's really uh, an interesting spice uh, and hopefully the chefs will, will get enough to uh, do something meaningful with it down in the kitchen something a, a novel taste definitely here is an example of not wasting space so I've got these gypsy peppers these are a sweet pepper very productive but at this stage, they're still small. So I took advantage of uh, the space between them to grow a crop of Mizuna mustard. That's just been harvested now, more or less. A lot of cutting has gone on. So it's just about time to start cutting it out and then giving the peppers room to grow. You can see some, some of those Salanova lettuces on the outside too. So that's just a way of maximizing the space, waiting for one crop to fill in. And when you have a lot of open space, throw something quick in. Mustard, mustard greens are perfect. Even a lettuce, if you're growing it from transplant and not from seed, can be done in about 30 days. So you can get that in and out and then give your peppers, like I said, space to grow. Look what I'm seeing here. That's a pupa of a ladybug. So it's becoming an adult. The larvae are really interesting. They're, they're these like black, little black and red alligator-like critters. And then after they've eaten enough, they eat a lot of aphids. They have a voracious appetite for aphids. That's why they're beneficial. They find a leaf to fix themselves to. Then they start to go through this body transformation. And eventually from out of that shell will emerge our familiar uh, red-shelled, black-spotted uh, ladybird beetle, ladybug. So that's the pupa. That's the transitional stage from the larva to the adult. It's good to see. It's a good sign. Yes, it is. This is lemon verbena. It's a nice, really nice herb. It, it just seeded itself over here. So I always like to, I always respect the self seeders. You know, I have a really hard, I pull out a lot of stuff and I thin out a lot of stuff. So I don't have a problem cutting off the life source to, to some veggies because you got to do that so the other ones can thrive. But when I get a self seeder, I have a special amount of respect for that crop. So I'm, I've been leaving this here. 
And lemon verbena is actually a great tea herb and uh, can be used in a lot of other ways as well. But behind it is a real find that we just got at a garden show this year. This is an oxalis uh, wood sorrel, except it's just these tie-dyed colors of kind of reds and some greens and pinks, really amazing hues. So this one's called Plum Crazy, Oxalis Plum Crazy. And uh, I hope the chefs are, I think they're using it in the salads down below. Real sour like all the other oxalises are, but just an amazing color palette. So some of what we're looking for is taste, of course, and fresh and really uh, novel on the tongue, but then sometimes looking for some visual sparkle too, and that's got both. Here's this uh, nasturtium relative I was mentioning. This beautiful little leaf here that on these little vines that are trailing them, so, climbing up, is called uh, mashua. It's um, so so that. Regular nasturtium is called uh, in Latin Tropeolum majus, and then the shades of green that we are looking at, those smaller ones, are called Tropeolum minus, and this is called Tropeolum tuberosum, and the tuberosum refers to a white radish like tuber that forms under the surface of the soil. That's the source of all these vines, and you can eat that and you can eat the leaves, and later on in the season, almost toward the end of the season in October, we'll see these beautiful little orange flowers come too, and you can eat those. And they have that same peppery nasturtium quality, but they all have a floral dimension too. So it tastes like a nasturtium flower in a way, except the, the real nasturtium flowers are just pure peppery. This tastes like what you would expect a flower to taste like if it were crossed with a nasturtium. So it's got a real floor quality. Also just love the scalloping edges, the scalloped edges of these leaves. Uh, they just create visual interest in a salad. Oh, this is, this is, we gotta take a look at this. We haven't really started using this for restaurant purposes yet, but the day is coming. Uh, this is a thornless prickly pear. The genus is Opuntia. And you know, you see prickly pears all over the place, especially as you start to get down to Mexico and California. But this is one that will thrive up here in our, in our winter climate. It's really ideally suited for a green roof because the green roof gets pretty dry. And so it just loves it up here for that. It's put out a number of these pads and pretty soon after we get a, a little bit more of a collection of pads, we'll start harvesting the top ones and then they grill them and make this Mexican specialty called nopales, which then you can pickle, you can do a lot with it. So it's a very succulent, fleshy pad and is mainly thornless, although I've picked up a few little irritating splinters, I would say, over the years. So I would still approach them with gloves. So these are what uh, Leather, our chef, likes to call the sexy greens. These are uh, Ruby Streaks Mustard, this, this beautiful mustard leaf. Very serrated, very uh, uh, multi-lobed. Um, that's a great must, delivers a really good mustardy punch right up your nose. Uh, arugula, of course. And then we have some Mizuna mustard over here. So these three get planted over and over and over again. And they'll use them in salads. They use them with various other plates uh, as, as kind of a bedding. They'll, they'll cook them down when they use them raw. Just uh, that's kind of the holy trinity. They call the leather calls them the sexy greens. We like to keep some radishes going all summer long. We tend to favor this um, uh, cylindrical, long radish called Davignon. It's a French radish, French breakfast radish. So that's just uh, been uh, a good performer. And con contrary to popular opinion, radishes can flourish all summer long, even in extreme heat, if you give them plenty of water, plenty of water. So we get radishes all, all summer long. This is a favorite called Costata Romanesco. It'll produce these nice ribbed fruits that have a really great taste. Um, big, huge flowers, and the chefs sometimes just want the flowers, especially the, the uh, well, I guess they use both the male and the female flowers. Really big flowers, they use them for battering and stuffing. So sometimes we're not even looking for the fruit, we're looking mainly for the flower. But uh, that's, a, that's a prize squash. 
Another one we grow that we have in some other beds is called Tromboncino, and it really runs. It'll run, I'll plant it at the corner of a bed like this, and it'll run along the fence. It's a vining squash, and it produces these long curly Q squashes that are pretty fragile and that don't actually go to market very well, so you don't find it at farmer's markets very often. Yet another advantage of growing your own rooftop garden. Pole beans are starting their climb up the poles. That's a that's one called rattlesnake. Peas are kind of doing their thing, but they're coming to the end. Here's a here's some turnips that we really love. These are great. Um, we grow these little Japanese turnips called hakure, and they are just super sweet and super succulent. Really, really delicious. So those are really pretty. Of course, the greens are edible too. So you can cut the tops, steam them down. Uh, Leather made a very innovative dish some years ago where he steamed down the greens and made what, what looked like a little nest of greens. And then he cooked the turnips in a little bit of sauce, but so that they were still white little globes. And then he put three or four of those as like little bird's eggs in a nest. Really great dish idea. I mean, that's what I like working with chefs for because they take something like this and they make they take it to one level higher an artistic level which is really exciting for me as a gardener this bed underneath has a little bit of a secret uh, it's got these uh, again dark oak leaf salanova lettuces that we really love and some parsley coming through too but this was basically all weeds underneath just a, a week or two ago so a lot of times i'll take the weeds from all of the garden pile them up in one of the beds, let them get so high, and then take the last and really water them down thoroughly. I might even sprinkle some uh, fertilizer in there to help them start to break down a little faster, some of our organic fertilizer. And then I'll put a layer of soil on the top and just plant right into it. And those weeds, they're actually giving off moisture as they decompose, and they create uh, you know, a, a really, uh, porous soil that can absorb moisture as you add it in the form of overhead watering or harbor watering. So crops seem to thrive. Eventually that curvature in the bed will sink down as that whole thing composts down. Uh, market gardeners in the past used to do that strategically and they'd actually even get a little heat from that decomposition process. So they could get a little season extension in the spring or fall with that composting heat as that bed cooked a little bit and would generate some heat, and they put a little cap of soil on the top and plant it right into it. Here's one of our favorite cilantros. It's a little hard to see the form of it. It's called Delfino, so it doesn't look like a regular cilantro leaf. It's not a wide, flat cilantro leaf. It, the Delfino refers to the fine textured shape of the leaves. It still has that same cilantro taste, but Oftentimes the leaf is a little bit more of a look-alike for a carrot leaf or something so people don't always know what they're getting and then they get a punch of the cilantro flavor and it's a nice surprise. Uh, we save our own seed so here we have uh, this plant going to seed but it's providing some other benefits too. The, uh, the flowers are attracting beneficial insects. Then here are the green berries, the seeds forming and the chefs can use these too. They're really tasty and flavorful really a powerful concentrated cilantro flavor then of course as they dry and turn brown that's the spice we call coriander so coriander is the is the dried brown seed and then when we plant it and we get the green leaf we call that cilantro this is something new I'm trying out this year these are called scented geraniums so one they're beautiful and, and pretty uh, but then they have flavors. Let's see, like this one's real lemony smelling. Here's a, uh, a rose scented one. Let's... Mm, oh yeah, that's really good, rose. And chefs can use these, they can flavor. Uh, one of the things that I've read that chefs do with them is, for example, put them in sugars, and let them sit overnight in a jar of sugar, and, and then the sugar takes on the flavor of the of these of rose or lemon or whatnot and then can be used for other purposes for desserts so this is just something uh, the chefs are going to experiment with this year our policy up here is if it doesn't work we get rid of it 
nobody wants to use it. Now these are pretty, so they, they could pot potentially stay just for their beauty, but beauty won't cut it alone up here. You gotta be a functioning member of the cast. So good looks don't do it totally. So anyway, after a year's experiment, if we don't like these, we'll dig them up and give them to one of the chefs or I'll plant them at my house or whatever and put something new. So it's a constant changing environment up here as we experiment with what the chefs are liking. I'm always trying to introduce some novelty. Sometimes it succeeds, sometimes it doesn't. And we're just always experimenting with it. All right, how awesome was that? We've got a great, great tour of the Noble Rot rooftop garden here in Portland, Oregon from our friend Mark Boucher Colbert. He's such a great gardener, gives us a great tour of this really, really awesome rooftop garden. We're so lucky to be able to have him collaborate with us here on this channel and bring us this really, really great rooftop feature here in Portland, Oregon. So, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, or anything at all about this really, really amazing rooftop garden or any questions for Mark himself, please hit us up down in the comment section below and give us a big, big thumbs up for this garden here. This is really, really amazing. And don't forget, hit that subscribe button down below and follow along with more garden adventures as we continue growing here on the Urban Gardener. And I'll see you again on the very next episode. Now that I got the stuff out of my teeth. <laughs> Urban Gardener, so glad all of you could join with me today on this very cool episode. We're back in Portland, or oh, that's. I just gotta remember to do it. Subscribe to the channel. Taste this and tell me if you've ever tasted anything like that before. Whoa. No. Isn't that amazing? That's called Papalo. Papalo. Yeah. But I mean, obviously it would be treated more like an herb where you're going to work it yeah. into something else and get just use the flavor. But that does, that pops, man. How about Ooh. these smelly? Let's hope some of this wind wasn't too much of a yeah, problem Yeah, and what's really us. cool, see here you got... Chin to serve their guests here at the restaurant. It's, uh, totally. Uh, so that's what I get for ad lib in that one. Oh, shoot. That's a beautiful little... See, so, yeah, I think I'm going to do my... I'm going to start right here and I'm going to kind of go... Rrr.